If you've ever binged a show on Netflix that you didn't even plan to watch, blame Vector Embeddings. Or purchase things on Amazon that you definitely didn't need, same thing. Vector Embeddings are the magic behind recommendation engines, searches, natural language processing, and a lot of the machine learning and AI capabilities that we see today, even chatbots like ChatGPT. So let's talk about what these are and how they work. A vector embedding essentially lets you see relationships between objects to establish meaning and context. So let's say you're doing sentiment analysis. The words good and great are pretty close in meaning, so they would be stored close to each other. And then placing some other words, we have sad and unhappy, those are similar, cold and hot are farther apart, and then loud and quiet are also pretty far apart. So that's the intuition behind it. But how does it actually work? As humans, obviously, we can just plot these words because we understand their meanings. But how would a computer do this? Well, first, we need to convert everything to numbers because computers deal with numbers. And that brings us to vectors, which is just a list of numbers. But let's get a little bit more specific on terminology. If we have just a simple vector, we can describe anything with that. The numbers that we see in the vector are fixed or manually assigned, meaning that we or some domain expert will figure out what numbers represent good or bad or sad or happy, for example. But there's no inherent relationships just in the simple vector that we're talking about. We just have number representations of words, good, great, sad, unhappy, but we don't know how they're related. Or to give you another example, if we stored values for a coffee shop in New York, we might have numbers for latitude and longitude, but that's it. They're just coordinates. An embedding, on the other hand, is a special type of vector that has meaning behind the numbers, and it represents something more complex than just numbers. These are learned by machine learning models. So, for example, we could feed in a book of text, and a machine learning model could analyze it, figure out how various words or sentences relate to each other, and then those similarities and context are captured. Back to the coffee shop example, with an embedding, we would be capturing additional qualities, like the overall vibe of the coffee shop, the quality of coffee, how popular it is, and so on, not just storing latitude and longitude coordinates. So those are the differences. You'll sometimes hear these words used interchangeably. You'll also hear vector embedding, which I tend to use. But for the purposes of this video, as I'm talking about embeddings, I mean all of the things over here on the right of the slide. OK, so how do we get an embedding? Well, we start with some kind of an object. This could be a sentence, an image, an audio file, a product review, a news article, really anything. It could even just be numbers to start with. We then feed it into an embedding model. And the whole job of this model is to transform objects into embeddings. Some popular examples of these models today for text would be word to vec or BERT embeddings. Or if you're working with images, you could use a convolutional neural network or CNN. And there's others out there as well. But once all of that work gets done, we have an embedding or a vector embedding that represents the object and its relationship to other objects. So that's the gist. But let's walk through a really simple example of an embedding model if we were building one from scratch and talk about how this works. Let's say that we're trying to find animals that are similar to one another, and here are the animals we're working with. As humans, we can obviously just look at these, and based on what we know about them, we would figure out their similarities. But let's be a little bit more methodical about it and think like a computer. What characteristics might we use to figure out how similar these animals are? We could think of things like size, number of legs, maybe habitat, what they eat, whether they're mammals or insects or birds, that kind of a thing. And in a machine learning problem, we have to figure out those things as well. Those qualities or characteristics are called dimensions. For our simple example, we're just going to go with three, size, number of legs, and diet type. And this will allow us to start working with numbers, which again is what the computer needs. So combining our dimensions with the eight animals that we have, it would look something like this. Now here I do have a short text description about what the numbers mean. But again, we want to keep reducing things just to the numbers. So ending up with something like this. 
Now we can look at these vector embeddings and visually see that dog and wolf are pretty similar, ant and spider are sort of similar, but let's plot these out so we can actually visualize how close they are to one another. I've got some Python code out here in a notebook in Google Collab. This uses the Plotly library, which lets you do 3D visuals. Don't worry too much about this code. I will make it available for download if you want to play with it. It's pretty simple though, but I really just want to show you the resulting animation, which will let us see how things are related. So let me run this cell. And then here is our visualization. Now these are interactive, so you can move it around. You can resize it. You can zoom in on it. Let me get it back to kind of where we started. We'll go with something like this, but you can hover over these points as well. So this was the goldfish. Now, just as humans, we know that the goldfish was pretty different from everything else. Size-wise, this was the smallest on this axis right here. It has zero legs, so it's pretty far from everything else that we've got over here. And you can really see that if you kind of move the chart around. We had several things that had four legs. So we've got cat, wolf, lion, and here was dog. So dog, depending on the perspective that you use here, dog and wolf are fairly close, and then cat and lion as well. But this group of things is more related, and we can tell that because they're closer together. So that distance between things is really key. And if you're a computer, you can calculate that distance in various ways, Euclidean distance, cosine distance, but it's all a part of how a machine learning algorithm can figure out what's related to make a recommendation or to do an image search and find similar images or figure out if a product review is positive or negative, that kind of a thing. So these embeddings really store a lot of information about similarities. Okay, now once you have figured out your embeddings, what do you do with them? Well, these days you might be hearing a lot about vector databases, which is a special kind of database optimized for storing and searching vectors. They can handle huge amounts of data, and they're really fast at finding similar things, even in a database of millions of records. These are used a lot today for things like AI chatbots, recommendation systems, search engines, the things that we've been talking about. Let's walk through a quick example of an AI chatbot. So let's say that you want a chatbot to assist your customer support team at your company. You've got a huge knowledge base of articles and product documentation, maybe images, troubleshooting guides, that kind of thing. So you would feed in that knowledge base into an embedding model, and it'll create the embeddings and store them in a vector database. Then when a user comes along and uses the chatbot, they can say, how do I return a damaged product? You would use the same embedding model here on that query text, and then you take the resulting embedding and search it against the vector database for an answer. So basically you're looking for similar things. The search might bring back articles about product returns or damaged products, results that are closely related to the embedding for the user's question. So in a nutshell, that's what vector embeddings are and how they work. If you enjoyed this, you might also like this other video about fine-tuning versus retrieval augmented generation, or RAG, which also uses vector embeddings. Check it out at the link here, and also consider subscribing for more bite-sized videos like this. Thanks so much for watching.